So let's start right off the bat with, um, let's talk a little bit about the election impact on the tax environment. So we're sitting in January, we've got, we're in the primary process, but it looks, it's kind of looking like it's not going to take a, a, you know, Punxsutawney fill to see where we're going to end up here towards November as far as who's going to be running. Um, So let's talk about the election impact on the tax environment. Yeah, so I think every time that we are going to evaluate an election, when it comes to our clients and retirement, uh, we have to evaluate it through two different lenses. Mm -hmm. The first evaluation is we have to look at the short-term impact. That's really about what is this Congress and this president that we're getting ready to elect likely to do around 401ks, IRAs, taxes, retirement savings. And then the second way we have to evaluate it is, okay, long term, let's take the sum total of this new Congress and president that we're electing, all of their spending, all of their legislative activity, what does that do long term to drive uh, America's economic environment, debt environment, and then because of that tax environment? So we've got an interesting situation. We were talking about this uh, yesterday over coffee. Um, We've got a rare situation because of the way the the rules are. if it's if it's Trump, if it's that it get, if, if that's the Republican candidate, which is looking more than likely that that's probably the case. If it's Biden, that's looking like that would be the case because mm-hmm. he's the incumbent. But we have a situation that we haven't seen in modern history, yeah. which is we would have we would we're going to end up with a lame duck president either way. How does that impact? And we didn't get to dive too far into this, but how does that how would that impact? Because they're not going to be able to be reelected. You know, it's interesting. We will have lame duck president one way or the other, but we aren't going to have lame duck parties. And what I think is so interesting about this moment in history is we are really in the middle of this um, political realignment of the Democrats and the Republicans. You know, uh, recent polling has showed that Republicans are bleeding college age, college educated women. Mm -hmm. uh, But Democrats are losing uh, ground with both blacks and Hispanics. So we are seeing this realignment, and we've seen it before. You know, um, all the Southern Democrats that became Republicans in the 60s and 70s, we had a realignment of the party. But because of that, even though we might have a four-year, one-term president coming up, uh, the parties have to flex their muscle quite a bit. And so I think we are still going to see a very active legislative environment no matter who wins, just because uh, even the parties within themselves are kind of fighting for whose legislative agenda is going to really dominate what yeah. that party is becoming. Do you think there'll ever be a third party candidate? Because it doesn't it seem, okay, my yeah. two cents. Doesn't it seem like the Democrats are going more, it's like they're going, both sides seem like they're going more to the edge. Yeah, well, it's to, actually uh, true. You know, this is, and this is going to get a little geeky, but do it. Uh, Pew, I think, put out a research a few years ago, and it looked at the number of elected officials that sit between the most conservative Democrat and the most liberal Republican. Gotcha. So they consider that kind of the moderate middle, right? Yep. And at the time, uh, you know, back in the 90s, there were probably 100 or so between those two uh, bookends. Yeah. Today, between the most liberal Republican and the most conservative Democrat is fewer than 20 members of Congress. And a lot of that is because of gerrymandering, redistricting. Yeah. We have really had this trend where we're trying to make districts that are easily won in the primaries and then will always be Republican or always be Democrat. But because of that, we actually do have more partisan government. So sometimes people say, it seems like things are more partisan. They are. Yeah. We are electing more officials in the primaries rather than the general election. That is true. Interesting. Well, it'll be interesting yeah. to see. But, you know, so those are the cards we're dealt. So yeah. between now— um, we were talking about this yesterday, too. So between now and uh, the election, do you think we'll see much legislation move through? Now, I think we're going to have a quiet legislative period probably this year. Just nobody wants to give the other side a win in an election yeah. year. I hate to say it, but uh, you know, you can try to push your priorities through. But we have divided government right now. I don't think anything's going to get a lot of movement. I will say, though, all that demand is going to pent up. So depending on who wins in November— Come January 2025, new president, new Congress, I think we are going to see uh, all of that release, it's like I a steam valve. Get some stuff done. That would be good. Um, so with that being said, mm-hmm. let's talk about um, – let's talk budget. Yeah. And let's talk about spending and what that means um, from the advisor standpoint. But so 2024 budget um, – 
Yeah, Let's so go. it was interesting. Uh, as our listeners may know, every year Congress has to pass appropriation bills to fund everything from defense to Department of Education to all of our government mm-hmm. agencies. And if they don't manage to pass those bills, which most years they don't, uh, they pass kind of continuing resolutions, which are kind of like, here's money to fund the government, even though we haven't passed our appropriations bills, but they're for a limited amount of time. And if we don't pass the continuing resolution by the deadline, of course, we go into government shutdown. Well, we just had a government shutdown uh, looming January 19th. House and Senate did agree on a continuing resolution package to now fund us through March 8th. What I thought was so interesting about that package is the agreed upon package between Republicans and Democrats was about $1.66 trillion to fund the government. It's numbers. Uh, it, yeah. It, those numbers are so big. They're big. It, it doesn't even like. No. Sh- so last year, uh, the government spending was about $1.6 trillion. So it's an increase over last year. And the reason that I think that's important to note is when we look at different, you know, we know we have a debt that is absolutely growing at yeah. unsustainable rates, $34.1 trillion today as we sit in this room. Uh, when we look at ways that Congress can control spending mm-hmm. to reduce that debt, I mean, even the negotiated agreement between the Republicans, let's rein in spending, and the Democrats came in higher than it was last year. And so I think really what we're fighting for is, are we going to spend more or spend about the same? There's really no one showing a path to spending less. Yeah. And that worries me because, of course— if you can't cut spending and you've got a debt that's growing and growing, we well, got to raise more revenue. Mm-hmm. And so then we're going to get into a situation where taxes rise. I think, and, and it's regardless of your party affiliation, mm-hmm. we, yeah. uh, taxes are going to have to, uh, we, they're just going to have to because there's so much that has yeah. to get paid for, right? So it's interesting. Every year, the Congressional Budget Office puts out full data for all the government uh, revenue that we took in and spending yeah. that we sent out. And it's public data. Uh, So the most recent data we have is for fiscal year 2022. And here's what's interesting. Uh, That year, we brought in as a nation about $4.9 trillion of revenue, primarily about 53% of that through individual income taxes. $4.9 trillion in revenue. That's a lot of money for our country unless we spend more than $4.9 trillion. So just on mandatory spending, forget what Congress and the president are doing. This is spending on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, things that are codified in law that we owe to the American people. We spent about $4.1 trillion. Golly. And then you add on top of that another half trillion to service our debt at today's higher interest rates. Well, suddenly we've used up almost all of our tax revenue just on the things that we are obligated to spend. Mm Mm-hmm. And then Congress comes in on top of that, of course, and they have to pass appropriations bills and fund the defense of our our nation and all of our agencies. And then maybe they want to pass additional spending bills. We can barely cover our expenses before Congress Mm -hmm. even meets. Once Congress meets, I think we spent over $6 trillion. It was like a $1.4 trillion gap between what we took in and what we sent out. It's not sustainable. So yeah. we are going to enter a rising tax environment. I can't tell you if it's going to be in the next two years or the next four years, but I can tell you that as, as advisors, as we're helping clients prepare for retirement, none of our clients want to be re, uh, retired for the next two to four years, right? Exactly. They want to be retired for 10, 15, 20, 30 years in the future. I do not see a path with today's demographic realities and spending mm-hmm. realities where we don't enter a rising tax environment in the midterm, at least. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, one of the things that we were talking about the other day was that you mentioned that when advisors have been working historically, the idea of, well, let's, you know, let's defer the taxes till later. Yeah. And now. Yeah, that started to come apart. You know, I sometimes call IRAs and 401ks, which I love. I have IRA money. I've got TSP money, which is like a government 401k. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of become a myth. It's become this great American savings myth that somehow we're going to be in dramatically lower tax environment and retirement than we are while saving. Yeah. And I'm not saying I can guarantee that you, Dennis, are going to be in a higher tax bracket in the future than you are today. I feel like that's probably- I think your taxes are going up. It's a pretty yeah. safe bet. But just like we mitigate market volatility with different um, allocation strategies or income volatility through fixed income or through uh, guaranteed income, yep. we have to mitigate this tax volatility. We have to make sure that if 
the vast majority of our clients and prospects have the majority of their funds in these tax-deferred vehicles, that they have some kind of hedge against mm -hmm. taxes going up. Because what we don't want to happen is retirement comes, taxes are higher than planned, and suddenly our clients don't have enough income. Yep. Yep. That, and that, there's just so much that's got to get paid for. There's so uh, much spending. Which, okay, so uh, yeah. with that being said, so we, we, if you're an advisor and you're not talking about taxation with your clients, you are, yeah. you are way behind and you're doing, I'll, darn, you're doing a disservice here. Um, God, that sounded harsh. But it? this year is the perfect opportunity to change that. Exactly. You know what? I heard, a, I heard a speaker and he said a streak begins with one. That is correct. Start today. So w you mentioned the government shutdown. Mm -hmm. um, is that just kind of a, kind of a BS way to get, you know, the, the, yeah. the threat of it like, oh, okay, well, we have to pass this and let's add some more money to the, to the debt. Is it just kind of a Weasley way of not addressing the problem? You know, I think the challenge is that there's really not agreement. Yeah. Uh, there's just a lot going on. It has been surprising to me, though, to see that even within the Republican Party, uh, the faction of the Republican Party that really wants to restrain spending mm -hmm. is just not the loudest dominant voice. Now, they're causing yeah. some disruption in terms of passing bills. But, you know, if Trump uh, is our president or, and is, is the uh, Republican nominee, you know, his form of populism really isn't about controlling spending. It's about cutting taxes and giving you back more of your money. Yeah. But it's still kind of a spending-friendly environment. Yeah. And so I think we're going to enter at least a near and midterm phase where really no one is saying, let's make sure this budget is balanced. Like the era of balanced budget may be dead for a little bit just because people want things. Yeah. And our elected officials want to give it to them. It is, you know, it is one of those things of, of – um you know, I we need to. We, people probably need to pay more taxes. Yeah. We need to pay this debt. Me? me? Oh no, God, not, not me. me, not me. I meant you guys. Yeah. I meant you. Even you know, while we were sitting here, I was thinking about. Um, was it like 08 when like Greece owed a ton of yeah. this? I, and I'm throwing this from left. Yeah. We didn't talk about this before, but like they had, they had so, so much, much debt. Talking austerity and and you know, as a, as like an American looking over, like yeah, you guys need to shape up and and uh, you're just going to have to tax more. And if that came over here, it's like whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, you we know. need to shape up. I read a fascinating stat. It said, uh, you know, there's gross domestic product, which is the, the economic output mm -hmm. of the U.S. There's also gross global product, which is the economic output of the entire globe. It would take the entire global, <laughs> gross global product. So everyone in the entire world working for three to four months to just pay down America's debt. All right. I'm going to... Great let's, news. Let's There's a solution. It. We can outsource that's it. That's right. Everybody, we, everybody except you and me. That's right. We just got to get everyone in the world, China and uh, Russia are going to love this. India too. Just every piece of economic output you have, let's just pay down our debt and we'll be fine. I think it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. The world population minus two. Minus two. Minus two. And our listeners, if you comment on this podcast, we'll exempt okay. you too. Yep. You're in. You're in You're with in. us. But let's talk about changing attitudes, anything you're seeing, changing attitudes towards 401ks and IRAs. Are they still the safe harbors that they used to be? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say the single thing that may be most impacted by the outcome of the 2024 election is the attitude in Washington towards 401ks and IRAs. Mm. Uh, you know, it's funny. I'm sure, Dennis, you were like me. You got your first paycheck. Yep. You were not uh, super flush with cash, and you thought I would love to spend this, but someone, a teacher, a you know, uh -huh. mentor, a parent, a boss said, no, put a little of that aside for retirement. And yep. if you do that month after month, year after year, you build your nest egg, you're responsible. We have heard a totally different tune coming from Washington in the past maybe four to five years. Mm -hmm. And it started with Build Back Better, which was the 2021 uh, legislation kind of fulfilling President Biden's campaign promises. Uh, in that legislation, there was a lo about $2.9 trillion of new taxes, mm -hmm. many of which were aimed at 401ks and IRAs that were aimed at retirement accounts. And there were these proposals, and we've heard the president and House Democrats saying things like, you know, we need to stop incentivizing through the tax code retirement savings once your account balances get to high levels. So really what Congress is saying is, hey, hold on. We want you to save for retirement, but if your account balance gets too big— yeah. We're going to have to come in, and we don't want to incentivize that with the tax code. And so we saw proposals that would have um, introduced new required minimum distributions applicable at any age for retirement assets that exceeded a certain government mm. set level. Uh, we heard it in uh, President Biden's 2024 budget proposal. He said, you know, 
uh, when he was rolling out that proposal, he said tax uh, tax uh, deferred retirement savings accounts are intended for middle class Americans to put a little aside for retirement, but they're being abused by wealthier Americans. You know, on the, on the campaign trail, yeah, that sounds like it would definitely resonate because you're like, hey, that's right, Bill Gates should not get to have a, a 401k. But the part that worries me, we were talking about this yeah. the other day, was then we get into the slippery slope of defining those yeah. deals. And you were talking. I say to savers all the time, you may be surprised to find that Washington thinks you're very rich. Yep. And so it's just, you know, it's this kind of rebranding of history that somehow uh, tax deferred and tax free, particularly retirement savings, are exclusively for middle class Americans. They're not for wealthier Americans. Well, most of our clients fall into this wealthier American bucket. Yeah. And I feel like 401ks, IRAs, Roths, they've just got this target on their back right now. So if President Biden has a second term and we have Democrats in control of the House or the Senate, at least mm -hmm. one branch, I think we're going to see continued proposals attacking these large balance 401ks, IRAs, preventing Roth conversions for higher net worth Americans. Uh, and that should concern all of us and our clients. You mentioned Roths. I wanted to ask you about this because yeah. to me, to me on its face, the Roth sounds like a, if you if you propose that right now, uh, somebody would say there's no way. Too there's good no to be way. True. Too good to be true. There's no way the government would do anything like. I mean, if you think about it, like you can put money, Becky, you can put money in. Yeah. Um, it'll be after tax. You got to pay your tax on first. But here's the deal: never tax again. Yeah, grow as much as you want. And wait, wait. I, so, and the government, and the government, the government. There's no way the government would do that now. Um, do you think that that's in jeopardy, the Roth, as a vehicle itself of just being yeah. eliminated? And, you know, we saw some of that in the Build Back Better legislation, uh, severe restrictions on higher net worth savers, not just contributing, but obviously converting funds into mm -hmm. Roth accounts. Uh, it's interesting. You know, Congress is not dumb. They can do the math. Mm -hmm. They know that the longer you defer your taxes in an IRA or 401k, the more tax revenue they get. But they also have to look at their balance sheet each year. Yep. And they know that the sooner they can get that tax revenue, uh, they need that money now. Uh, yeah. So I think we're always going to see some limitations. It will be hard. It will get increasingly harder for people with large account balances or higher incomes to convert funds into tax-free accounts because, you know— Congress knows that you're getting out of that. They know it's a good deal. Yeah. That's why they're limiting it, because they want you to keep deferring those taxes so they get more money. I do think, though, we'll always have Roths because the government appreciates that flush of cash yeah. at the time of payment. And, you know, on, on, on the whole, the idea of incentivizing, yeah. you mentioned that word before, but, you know, yeah. the incentivizing people to save for their own retirements, that is a good thing. That The scary thing is the definite, you know, Who's yeah. defining the numbers, and then all of a or sudden, who is it a good thing? Yeah, and you don't. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't think you're. This, this drives me nuts because you'll flip on. Um, gosh, what is it? It's like the how the home channel or whatnot. And yeah, you'll be oh, watching, HGTV. Yeah, you'll be watching somebody buying their like their third vacation home. You're like, man, I you know I have a nice living, but I, this guy's got like they're buying a house yeah. in Aruba for the same. This is their third house at the same price as mine. Most people aren't doing that. So like you were saying, yeah. you're in that percentage. Um, You'd mentioned yesterday mm -hmm. the amount of uh, – you did a breakdown of the amount of taxation that comes from savers or uh, earners. Can you hit that again? Yeah. So this is interesting. You know, yeah. we've heard President Biden and the Democrats kind of have this mantra like, don't worry, nobody making less than $400,000 a year is going to have their taxes mm -hmm. raised, period. And I just have to call BS on that, and here's why. Uh, long term, that promise cannot be fulfilled because if you look uh, – American taxpayers making $400,000 in a year and above mm -hmm. pay about 39% of individual income taxes. So if we're only raising taxes on those people, we are affecting a very small part of our revenue. Yeah. If we can lower that to people making $200,000 and above, that's about 70% uh, of income tax revenue. If we can implement new taxes on people making $100,000 a year and above, that mm -hmm. represents almost 90% of Gross. income tax revenue. And if you remember, yeah. the majority of all the revenue our country takes in is through individual income taxes. So we, I read a, uh, I'm trying to remember who it came out of, AEI or, or one of the uh, think tanks, did an analysis where they looked, if you took 100% of American income 
above a half million dollars, mm -hmm. all of it taxed 100% above half million dollars, you could not pay down our debt. Yeah. You would not get us out of the financial problem we're in. So they have to have more broad-based taxes to fund the kind of spending that we're seeing. Yeah. So clearly, if you're an advisor listening at this point, and it should be hitting you right between the eyes, you need to be looking at tax mitigation strategies. Speaking of tax strategies, um, so let's just say, I'm curious to pick your brain on this. Yeah. Um, so we have the TCJA that's sunsetting in yep. 2025. So does that mean that if Trump stays in office that the sun doesn't set on that signature piece of legislation? Yes, yeah, so this is interesting. If you look at uh, tax cuts, back to the Kennedy tax cuts in the 60s, most of them are allowed to expire. And it's mainly because the political value of that tax cut's been used up. So Congress needs to then go pass something else to get credit for it, right? Mm -hmm. Someone else already got credit for those cuts. But we've also never had a situation where a signature piece of legislation is by a president who was then defeated and now comes yeah. back into office. So I have to imagine if Trump is the winner uh, and Republicans have a stronghold of the House or the Senate, uh, they we're going to see them push to extend those tax cuts. Do you think they'll extend it or let it go and then come up with a snappier name? And, and uh, Yeah, I think because it bears his name, we might try to extend it. But here's yeah. what's interesting. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, it's the Trump tax cuts. Yeah. They're the biggest, best tax cuts we've ever had. <laughs> but I will tell you, this is interesting. Um, you know, this is where my opinion has kind of changed maybe over the last two years. Interesting. Because... You know, we were really preparing in 2026, once the tax cuts expire in 2025, for taxes to rise. I was preparing mm -hmm. for my own taxes because all of our tax brackets are reverting back to those older, higher rates. Mm -hmm. But there are actually two things that make up tax brackets. It's the bracket rate and then the amount of income applied to that bracket in a right. progressive uh, taxation system. What's interesting is the amount of income applied to those brackets is adjusted for inflation. And two uh -huh. years ago, I just did not imagine the amount of rapid inflation that we have seen yep. uh, here recently. So I do think, you know, real wages tend to lag behind inflation by a few years. Mm -hmm. So we may find in 2026 our brackets are higher, but for some tranches of our clients, the amount of income applied to that bracket may be less because uh, uh -huh. of inflation. And so our real taxes may take a little bit longer to kind of readjust and back to their normal rates. The current mm. tax bracket rates are about 30% below what rates were in the 90s and early 2000s. So we're about 30% lower than kind of historical average. Uh, but there are some interesting math that will happen in 2026 if those brackets do expire. That said, long term, you know, again, uh, retirement is not about 2026, 27, 28. It's about 10, 20, 30 years yeah. in the future. So over time, we're all going to see higher taxes. All right. Left field question that just Bring popped it. into my head. Uh, flat tax versus progressive. You know, I don't. I, so uh, flat tax was all the rage when I was uh, working on Capitol Hill. Uh, it is, I think, too big of a lift to try to change the U.S. taxation system. I bet. Because there's, there's such a, there, yeah, it would be it would be massive and it would be... And you forget that you change federal law and all the states have to change state law that yeah. is tied up to federal law and how uh, we tax things federally. That's the thing out of, every, out of everything we're talking about with, uh, with the different parts of the debt and, and money that has to be raised. Um, there is no single thing. It's not like you can pull one little lever because it's such a complex system of all these different things that if you fix, you just you yeah. just can't fix one thing and it, it automatically solves everything. Yeah. You've got a, these little... And that's tweaks. the spending problem. Yeah. You know, we can look at the bills Congress passed and say, oh, this economic stimulus bill, there's this Infrastructure Investment Act. You know, are these, we got to save money. We're spending too much. But it's drops in the bucket. The yeah. vast majority of our spending is on things that we want for our clients, Medicare and Social Security. The um, 2020 census actually showed that the percentage of our population age 65 plus is at the highest level in a century since 1880. Mm. We've had the most rapid growth in aging population. So those demographics are baked in. Now, that said, Congress is also in kind of a spendy mood. You know, we saw uh, 
in addition to these appropriations packages, right, $1.66 trillion just to fund the military and all the government agencies, yep. Congress also likes to come and kind of pass some additional bills. And we've seen, uh, you know, 2020, we had $3.5 trillion in economic stimulus from the COVID pandemic. Yeah. 2021, we had another $1.2 trillion from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. 2022, we had about $740 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act, which didn't much reduce inflation, but it did drive up the debt. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing every couple of years, or sometimes every year, these multi-trillion dollar spending packages. We're just, getting, we're just getting used to it. Yeah, I just don't think that that's changing. Yeah, that's scary. And so I think the only piece of the equation, too many old people to get mandatory spending under control, a growing debt with very high interest rates, not can't get our debt service under control. Yeah. In 2023, it was almost a full trillion dollars that's of debt service. Uh, Congress isn't going to appropriate less to the agencies and the defense of our nation. And yeah. Congress is still going to pass these big spending bills. What's left? Taxes. We got to make more money as a country. What do you think the, uh, I guess I should know this, but if if we were to, if I would, if I had the the age demographic yeah. across, the, across the U.S., I'd get a little cold closer to the mic. But if I had that, where is that, where is that, uh, that those retirees, like you, you, where are we... Yeah. When's mortality going to kick? That's terrible. But you know what I'm saying? Like, when is that yeah. bulge going to well, that's pass all the way through? That's part of the challenge. Not are just are people living longer in retirement, but they're living healthier with higher yeah. medical expenses. Uh, so the programs, because, you know, look, it's easy to say, oh, people are living too long, so it's your people living too exactly. long. We all want Medicare to cover every intervention that they can to help keep our loved ones healthy. Mm -hmm. But there's a cost to that. Huge cost at the towards the end of towards the end of life, and Medicare is 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 drowning under that. Oh. Social Security is not any better. It's interesting. Every year, the Social Security trustees put out a report, and they put out a report in 2023 in August. And the second line of this report, the first line was like, Social Security is an important benefit that all Americans get to support them in retirement. The second line said, Social Security is not sustainable with current tax and benefit rates. Yeah. Let me tell you, politically, we are not going to see a bunch of politicians saying, you know what, Dennis, we're going to give you less Social Security. Yeah. Sorry, we can't deliver that whole Social Security check. So I think taxes have got to go up on it. That is, You know what, that is a tough one because you, if you could look at it dispassionately mm -hmm. and you looked at the data – and you'd be like, okay, um, people are living longer in retirement. People are healthier. and re They're able to do these mm -hmm. things. So, I mean, obviously we should move maybe the retirement age back uh, to a little longer because people are living longer. Yeah. And you know what? There's this much dollars. There's that many people. We're going to have to yeah. bring it down just a little bit. That un logically, that makes sense until you say like, but I'm talking about you. Oh, the hell you're not. Oh, I don't want to work till I'm 82. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So I just think right now, you know, it's not just knowing what's happening in Washington with spending yeah. and with these attitudes. It's really how do we communicate that to our clients? Yep. Uh, and this 2024, because of the election, it's just given us a great environment to educate into. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting. At Stonewood, we test a lot of different messaging. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. One of the top converting messages right now is, will the 2024 election impact your retirement? And I think it converts so well for a couple of reasons. One, it's about something that is on everyone's mind. Yep. Two, uh, people don't know the answer to that. I don't know how to evaluate this election that I'm worried about if it impacts me yeah. in my retirement. And the good thing as an advisor, you, as an advisor, you know the answer to that. The you answer do. is yes. And that's the, the third board. piece is yeah. they need your help to answer it and yep. do something about it. And so... Uh, you know, I know a lot of advisors have already incorporated kind of taxes and tax messaging into mm -hmm. their practice. It's not just talking about taxes. It's really bringing up taxes as this new risk class Absolutely. that we have to hedge against. Look, we are hedged against market risk. We are hedged against income risk. We have to make sure you have some diversification in your portfolio mm -hmm. to be hedged against tax risk, or else we are leaving you fully exposed to the whims of Washington. Yeah, I love I the way... You all approach, and the way you educate, because down that way yeah. in that room, we've got, uh, you know, when we host like these all advisors, the time. Yeah. yeah. And we're going through, and the book, everything you all do, it is a, it is an approach that is different 
uh, than what I've seen. And it's great and it's so timely. So let's, okay, so let's talk about a couple last okay. things here. We'll, we'll, we'll land this plane. Um, so uh, as you look, what, what are you watching? What, what, are, what, is, what is Becky Swansburg watching right now? So well, let me back it up. So as an advisor, one of the things you absolutely, your takeaway from this is you need to be talking to clients about their tax situation and what the future looks like for them. Uh, you need to be looking at tax mitigation strategies, and it's a great way to leverage the opportunity yeah. to get in front of people. That being said, Becky, let's put the punks, yep. Punxsutawney Phil hat on. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this for Russ in the studio because he loves when I say that because I say it all the time. <laughs> Um, what are you watching specifically? The number one thing I'm watching is overall spending. Year by year, what are we spending as a country? Because mm -hmm. I think that is the top indicator of over time where taxes need to go. And I want to be clear, it may not always be the in individual income tax. Uh, we tend to think about taxes and retirement as like, what's our tax bracket on this income we're pulling out? But mm -hmm. there are a lot of levers Congress could sp uh, pull. Uh, Social Security right now is only taxable up to 85%. Well, that's going to happen. That's only been since the 90s. It was taxable at 50% in the 80s and not taxable before that. Congress passed a new law tomorrow, make it all taxable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just about the level of taxation in terms of your tax bracket. It's about the structure of taxation. What is taxed? When is it taxed? Who is it taxed and how, for and how is it taxed? Mm -hmm. We saw that in the SECURE Act with the stretch IRA being eliminated for most inherited IRAs. Yeah. Suddenly now you got to pay those taxes in 10 years. They didn't change the inheritor's tax bracket, but they sure changed their tax burden yeah. when accessing those funds. So uh, I think we have to watch Congress is going to get creative. And just because brackets aren't changing doesn't mean that our clients aren't incurring higher total taxes. And they don't care about their bracket. They care about how much yeah. money is in their wallet. Now, you said something, uh, and I've heard you say it before. You've got a couple phrases that I absolutely love. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, how tax law is written. Oh, yeah. The tax law is written in pencil. Yes. I think one of the wildest things in IRAs, 401ks, all tax-deferred savings, is like you come into these savings approaches with this bet that your taxes are going to be lower in the future yeah. than they are today. But we forget that every piece of tax code is written in pencil. Yep. None of this is in permanent marker. And the tax code you started saving under is almost guaranteed not to be identical to the tax code you retire under. Yep. We're just hoping they don't erase a part that impacts us. Well, let's get some of our funds into something that's written in permanent marker that yeah. Congress can't constantly erase. That is interesting because, you know, we, we, I mean, we're building our retirement on this foundation. And one of the things that's bedrock is that we have the assumption that, okay, the tax laws, well, this is the way it's yeah. going to be. And you're right. It's, uh, it is in pencil. You have another one. There's another phrase that I've heard oh. and judge learned hand. Oh, judge learned hand. One of my favorites. Okay. Judge learned hand is a, uh, was a, court of a U.S. Court of Appeals judge, mm -hmm. and he is the most quoted uh, lower court judge by the U.S. Supreme Court. And some people think it's because he's smart. I think it's because he is witty. And he has a quote that I absolutely love, and this is his quote. He says, uh, there are two systems of taxation in this country, one for the informed and one for the uninformed. Yep. And I think that's what all of us are trying to do as financial advisors to our clients we're just trying to help you save for retirement under the system of taxation for the informed. Yeah. I say all the time, you cannot make informed decisions without information. And when it comes to taxes, it's not that our clients aren't making informed decisions. They don't have the information. Mm -hmm. No one has ever evaluated for them the cost of tax deferral. They know that they've deferred their taxes. They got the benefit while they were saving. But what does their retirement tax bill look like yeah. once they reach retirement? I think that would, I, that would be an approach in a conversation that I think a client would be just, it would flip them on their ear. Like, well, what, wait, what? Yeah, I've never, someone, someone's never talked to me about the, the disadvantage of my tax deferral. Um, speaking of speaking to clients, yeah, I want to, I, I do want to pivot one other thing. So you have a rare opportunity to give us some enlightenment here. All right, I'm going to try. So you're an advisor, yep. you're sitting there, and unless Unless you want to only talk to people who are exactly like you. I guess if you're rich and they have a lot of assets, then fine. But, you know, we're so, we're polarized. Mm -hmm. It's such, it, you know, politics used to be like something no one talked about. And now it's like. The number one topic. Yeah. For, I, who cares? But anyway, how do you, any advice that you have for advisors and having conversations 
because they're going to have to have conversations about this. But so much of what we're talking about is not partisan. It's just like tax facts. You yeah, know? that is a great question. I have advisors ask me all the time, like, how do I talk about the election without being political? Yes, yes, like, I don't yes. want to offend my client by bashing Biden or Trump. Like, what do I do? And I want to assure everybody listening, the thing that causes legislative risk and tax risk in our clients' retirement approach mm-hmm. has nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats. In a way, it doesn't matter who's in the White House come January. What is driving that volatility and that instability is the fact that we have two-year election cycles here in America. Mm -hmm. So every two years, we have new government, which is pretty wild. But that means that it doesn't matter if the person you absolutely love that you know will protect your retirement wins in two years, because what happens two years after that and two years after that and two years after that? We cannot predict the next 10 to 15 election cycles. Mm -hmm. No one can. Mm -hmm. The best political commentator has no clue what's happening 30 years from now in the political landscape. And so unless we've helped our clients protect a portion of their retirement assets from these changes from Washington— Every two years, they're going to have to have this anxiety of just hoping that we get a good president and a good Congress that doesn't come after their retirement assets. And And that's too much stress. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's like, uh, I think you have an analogy around 401ks that I love. Oh, about uh, about business owners. Okay, so so I want to pause you before you say it. So if you're listening to this podcast Put a put a pin in this section. I think this is brilliant. Yeah, this is one of my favorite favorite uh, ways to frame up what is happening with taxes in Washington. Yes. So this is especially good if any of our listeners have a, a group marketing. If they're doing seminars or workshops, I will often ask clients: uh, raise your hand if you own a small business or a friend, a family member of yours owns a small business. And almost everyone puts their hand up. Everyone yes. knows someone that owns yep. a small business. Say, imagine I'm a partner in your business, and I own 20% of your business. At the end of the year, you take profit out of your company. You know that you owe me 20%. 20%. I own 20% of the business. I get 20% of the profit. Well, what would you do if next year I came to you and I said, actually, Dennis, this year, I'd like 30% of your profit? Well, you know, if you're like me, you'd say, I don't know, kick rocks, maybe not quite that politely, (laughs) but uh, you don't get 30% of the profit. You only own 20% of the company. But here's the thing. The IRS is a silent partner in your 401k and your IRA. And it's a partner that can change its ownership stake at any time. Yep. And this year they may be happy with 20% ownership. Next year they may want 30% ownership and there is nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. I say, look, I wouldn't accept that kind of risk in my business and I don't want you to accept that kind of risk in your retirement approach. And it is wild to watch clients and prospects the light bulb go off and suddenly they realize like there is so much risk because Congress can just change the rules at any time. Yep. And I have no protection against it in my current approach. That is a brilliant, brilliant analogy, brilliant story. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're going to wrap on this. Three things that an advisor, you just finished listening to this, you got, you're here. Three things somebody should do right yeah. now. First of all, if you're doing any group marketing, live events, uh, Bring the election into it. You don't have to bring it in politically, but let's Mm -hmm. just say, hey, let's evaluate what this election could mean for your retirement. I'm telling you, it converts. So that is the key marketing message. The second is don't forget your existing book of business. So if Um, you have clients that you manage their funds or you've helped them with an annuity, but you haven't done any kind of tax conversation with them, This year with the election is a great opportunity to say, hey, so glad I could help you mitigate market risk and income risk. Let's complete that approach with some mitigation of tax risk. Love it. So work that book of business. And number three is do not be afraid to just make taxes part of every conversation. The worst that can happen is someone tells you, I don't mind the level of taxes I'm paying. But I will tell you that um, it's not enough just to say taxes are bad. Mm -hmm. We've got to be able to uh, analyze them for clients to be able to say, you might not realize you have this huge tax bill coming due in retirement. You got to do something about Mm -hmm. it. And Mm -hmm. let's do something about it now before it gets worse because heaven knows what's coming our way in January. And you've got to to have the education. Yep. I mean, you're not a tax... If you're... uh, Most of us are not tax experts. We can help the conversation. 
And somebody might say, well, I have a CPA for that. I always, in my opinion, CPAs, I saw your lip curl. That's hilarious. Uh, CPA, <laughs> no, I love CPAs. CPAs to me, are, they're like chroniclers of the past. Yeah. CPAs are very good at a micro approach to taxes of saying, yep. how do we mitigate taxes this year? And where I think advisors add such a nice compliment to that is now let's look at how to mitigate lifetime taxes Love it. through retirement. So you're never going against a CPA. It's just kind of completing that tax narrative of let's look at taxes today, but let's also remember that what really matters is reducing lifetime taxes into retirement. And that's what, you know, as a financial professional, I'm here to help you do. I love Becky, we're going to have you back on uh, a little later in the year. Yeah. Uh, so again, we're putting this out uh, end of January, and but these are like we'll these are we salient go. take. You know what? We probably, in all reality, everything we said is going to be probably the same advice yeah. that we would give. I will make this guarantee: Ooh, there is it. no outcome of this in election that gets us out of the long-term debt problem mm -hmm. and spending problem that this nation has. I don't care who wins. I don't care who's in the White House and the halls of Congress in January. We have a spending problem. We're going to have a rising tax problem, and. Uh, all we're doing is kind of nipping around the edges, depending on who wins. Yep. There we go. Becky, thanks for being on. Thanks for and, having me. Uh, for everybody else, if you get a chance, uh, check us out. Um, you can find us on every anywhere that you like podcasts. Uh, you can watch us on YouTube. You can watch us on the, our YouTube channel. You can watch us on uh, the Complete Advisor Podcast uh, .com. We've got our own website. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, subscribe, if you follow, uh, you'll be notified anytime there's a new breaking episode. And then also, if you get a chance, I would love to hear your comments, your feedback, any topic you want us to dive into, any fact checking you want to do, I'll pass those on to you. That's right. Because uh, you're a tax expert, not me. I just pay it. I'm, the, I'm in the uninformed category right. trying to figure We're things out. We're getting you informed. We're getting there. Becky, thank you so much. Everybody else, uh, we'll see you next time.